Perfect. All righty. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brianna Morin, and I'm working with Alberta Recreation and Parks Association. And I would like to officially welcome you to a virtual conversation with Dr. Reg and Rose Kroshu on the importance of Indigenous elders. So thank you all for joining us here today. A quick note for our participants. So this webinar is being recorded so that you and others can enjoy it at a later time. So at the end, we'll make sure to let you know again that we will be sharing this webinar with you later following this webinar. Um, so before we begin, as is protocol, I'd like to first offer some tobacco to Dr. Reg and Rose Kroshu so that we can start this conversation off in a good and meaningful way. So Dr. Reg and Rose, this is my tobacco for you. Janet, of course, will bring it to you in person as she's located much closer to you than I am. <laughs> but here it is. And for those of you, if you do have your smudge here today, um, I welcome you to join in also in a way that is meaningful to you. So Reg and Rose, take it away. Okay. Itamix uh, Kanaten. Welcome. Uh, my name is Reg Kroshu. I'm from the uh, Bikani First Nation, and we're zooming in from uh, Bikani uh, First Nation. I just want to maybe share that we start our formal formal spaces, we open them up with, with smudge. And, and it's in our oral practices that uh, the smudge reflects the parallel to a, a gavel, a call to order. So we want to light our smudge to provide that call to order of a safe space. And the sweet grass we burn in our smudge is that sanctified kindness that uh, uh, we understand that creator gave us uh, to give all that sanctified kindness to all of creation in other humans and, and animals and plants. So I just want to like my smudge now and we can acknowledge uh, 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 creator this morning to start our, our webinar. So a lot. And we and it's also acknowledging to create the gifts that we get every day. I call this webinar and all of us coming together and having this discussion, I call it a gift, even though it's on Zoom. I wish it was in person, but it, it is a gift to be able to talk to all of you through this webinar. So I want to thank Creator for that gift. But other gifts, my there was relatives that got sick with COVID and they're still in hard times. So I'm asking for for blessings for them, but uh and all the elders uh, 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 to give them uh, a good life. So those are, and, and the webinar to go good and have a safe space to talk. So that's what I'll be, I'll be uh, talking about or. Oh, it's your bad to be. I will not be not do. Oh, you dance, got your mother for our Christian art. And I will spoon walking on up to Tokyo. Alhaka <laughs> Ayo, Makita Mout Kais, Yoko, six or Soko, six ago, Hachitsi, Eta Mout, Eutach. Oh, Gaps, the dog and a Christianai is sin now and strays chased dogs in. Ayo, Matmakano, Achimos, Gawan, Christianot, and the US Pomosa. Oh, Gaps, the dog, you dance, catch him, Madame Stitchy day. Tayaxi, ah, Ichinikoyaxi, Chips, and I, 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 I,
Naki naki tama ko kopi masawa ni kaya ako si ko ispinan ayon na ako si tapito si sinan ako si si tapes pumaya hana ko makita pio ako kimatok na wanti mo si tapet pio hana kasi sa pio ako kaya magkita na tapo kopi maya ay chini kaya ako si ko yichini ko tayo ako si ko ay spumbo si na si tapet pio pana ko makita pio Matapachimo is gonna get sit of cock, walk pure, kiss your pet up your mock big cono, sour, stoke out, cut off its sapoya, only book a moat or so good. I is the pet of your pen up book, cow, matapachimo. I is for Musa, Makistic Satosis, Kinimata, is so chicked up or do marking. Oh, caps, doggy cock of his catopna, come with an nest of watchman. Axi pet up his inanyan. Thank you very much. And I pass it back to Janet. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Reg and Rose. And so, um, Brianna, as our moderator, <coughs> I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Janet. And thank you so much, Dr. Koshu, for that beautiful blessing and for getting us started off in such a beautiful way. So really happy to have you guys here. Um, so as mentioned earlier, my name is Brianna Morin and I work for ARPA, Alberta Recreation and Parks Association. I'm also your moderator, as Janet mentioned. Um, right now I am currently finishing off an internship with ARPA and that has been sponsored by Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. And I'm also working really closely with some engagement and reconciliation work with ARPA's Communities Choose Well program. So hello to some of you that I already know. Um, a little bit quickly about me right now, I would like to acknowledge that I, I do reside on Treaty 6 territory and that I am calling in from Amiskwichis Waskahikin, which is the traditional name for the city of Edmonton. So it's also known as Beaver Hills House. Um, my dad and his family were all born and raised in Enoch Cree Nation, which is located just west of Edmonton here. And although I was raised off reserve, I do feel very proud, very honored to be connected to such a beautiful culture. And that I also get to continue my journey of learning more about this culture and my culture through the current work that I'm doing here at ARPA. So while I am your moderator, I also look forward to continuing my learnings alongside each and every one of you guys here today. So let's get started. But before, um, I, as I've mentioned earlier, we are here for a virtual conversation with Dr. Reg and Rose Kroshu on the importance of Indigenous elders. And before we do get to our wonderful headliners, Reg and Rose, I'd first like to welcome Janet Naklia, who is the Director of People and Programs for ARPA. She's going to share with us a brief presentation about ARPA's recent elders culture camp that took place back in August. So Janet, take it away. Thanks, I know. It's like, um, just as all of you were waiting for Reg and Rose, boom, the opening act. So, you know, it's like the Beatles and I'm not the Beatles. So no booing or hissing, none of that. It's okay, I'll be very short and brief. Um, but first I did want to um, thank Reg and Rose for the prayer for today. And um, say, I woke up this morning with a, a little skip in my step because it's amazing to be able to spend the morning with you too. So thank you for that. The name that my mom gave me is Janet. I also have um, a spirit name, Nia Muskiki Kihu Esqueo. So that's Cree for I am Medicine Eagle Woman. And that name was given to me by um, Daryl Brass Sr., the late Daryl Brass, and his wife, Linda Brass. This the Wanagok Omska Pitaki. That also means uh, my name is um, Southern Eagle Woman. So it's my Blackfoot name given to me by Chief or John Chief Moon Sr. So it's an honor to have those names and to acknowledge them in a good way, because it's very much about the work that we're doing and what we'll be talking about today. Um, unlike Brianna, I'm here in the South in Musqu not Musquachese, Wilkinsis. I was in the wrong territory for a second. I am in um, the traditional Blackfoot territory. Um, well, Kinsis is the Blackfoot name for Calgary. So in honor of our speakers today, I would like to acknowledge that territory. All right, so I will be brief, I promise. I know everyone's here to see Reg and Rose. So I do have a presentation on the elders camp that is directly um, connected to what we're talking about today. So I'm gonna share my screen here. <clears throat> okay, so 
the conversation we're having today, it's very much, and you can see that screen, right? Brianna, you're good? Okay. So what we're discussing today very much is the importance of elders and the connection to recreation and parks and what we can do to help create capacity. So this came out, the elders camp that we did, as Brianna mentioned in August, came out of early conversations we had with Dr. Reg, Crochu and Rose, about creating capacity for elders in Treaty 7. And the question is, hey, what does that mean and why do we even need to do that? And a lot of people assume that elders are just magically here, that you get older, you, get, you gain wisdom and you're an elder. But what we have seen and what we have heard recently in the news, um, the whole residential school um, history that we have in Canada might be new to some, but obviously not new to the community who have been facing the impacts of residential school for generations. And one of the impacts that came out of residential school, I know that Res and Reg and Rose will talk about, was that disruption of knowledge. And so the challenges with capacity among elders, which also led to the fact that a lot of elders, not a, there was like a small group of elders doing work with everybody. So while we all have Zoom fatigue now, there's a thing called elder fatigue where the capacity wasn't there and we were just putting too much stress in the elders. Um, here in Treaty 7, but I know, honestly, it's an issue across Canada. So Reg and Rose, um, we partnered with them. Um, we made good relations um, that we basically adopted Reg and Rose as our family. And in fact, they have been very key in all of the reconciliation work that ARPA has done since 2015 when the TRC came out and um, moving forward in a good way. So they're like, hey, we need to do something with capacity. And so we um, started camps, originally youth and elder camps, but then it then eventually became an elders camp as of last year. And the second part of our conversation was why last year um, COVID. So what came out of, so we have the strain of uh, residential school disruption, intergenerational trauma in the community, and then hit by COVID, which was obviously attacking the vulnerable. And um, due to this pandemic, unfortunately, we have lost elders. And I just wanted to say here, acknowledge um, Daphne Good Eagle, who was a key elder for a lot of the work um, that ARPA did, she passed away due to COVID and with her, we lost a library of knowledge. And I know even to this day, I still feel the impact of her loss and I know we all do. So the elders identified last year, hey, ARPA, you're working as a relation, a good relative of ours. Um, we need to work together to create elder specific capacity so that all of us, all institutions, all organizations and the province itself can benefit. And we wanna do it on the land. Your recreation and parks, we have that connection. And so that's where the, 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 the kernels of the camp came from. So that's just the introduction. Um, I'm just gonna now quickly just go through what it was about and then turn it over to Reg and Rose. So, um, hold on. Next. So what was the camp about? It was about elders. So here we have um, Elder Evelyn Kelman and her daughter, Debbie Kelman. They came to the camp. There were 30 elders at the camp. So multi-nation elders, actually. Blackfoot, Cree, Métis, um, Medeoan. So all elders who are in the Treaty 7 area. And then their helpers. And so helpers were identified as elders in training, the next generation up, and it ranged in age because of that disruption. It could have been 20, they could have been 60, they could have been 70. So basically it was elders who had that capacity to be the, the next elders up in theory. Um, and then of course there were camp helpers as well. So those are the people who came together to plan this camp, and I should say that it was elder led. So the camp was, the content was designed by the elders to meet the current needs of elders themselves. And we basically helped as helpers. Now here, huh, so this is where, so as Brianna was saying, so she's um, doing a great job as moderator. Thank you, Brianna, for stepping up. But she also attended camp with myself, and this is where we stayed. 
So this was Palais Royal. We stayed here on the land because again, the connection that the elders were saying was that land-based teaching. So as much as there is this capacity, that connection to the land, which is what a connection ARPA has as well, that was a key to their learning. So they said, let's do it outside on the land. So here is just where we were staying. And I also wanted to point out behind is the um, sweat lodge. So obviously ceremony and we're also a key part of what we did at the camp. On the note of ceremony, there were key points. So ca um, capacity building, ceremonial knowledge transfer, and then healing came out as um, top themes. So here we have, who's that? Who is that handsome gentleman on the right? You see uh, Dr. Koshi there on the right, um, sitting next to Tyler Mackinac, who is a um, band leader, band council for Ermanskin and the Choose Well Champion. Um, so obviously we couldn't record ceremony, but I just wanted to, um, there, but there were many ceremonies that happened. Um, each nation hosted a different ceremony to teach the elders their ways each morning. And I just want to acknowledge this piece because um, like Brianna said, she's learning, we're all learning. So I'm constantly um, honored to um, bear witness to certain important events. And this is um, Dr. Kosho, he might talk about this with his head chief headdress of which was transferred to him at camp. So we all got to witness it. And I think it's one of those historic events that I will witness once in my lifetime. So those who were there were able to take part in really key parts of ceremony. So um, this is one of the key things. Um, the other thing we did was sharing. Hey, look, there's me working. I do work when I go to camp. Um, so really conversation. So again, like I said, elder led because we need a, to be as a sector and allies to support elders when they need to do their business. And so part of this business was discussing the impacts of residential school. It was discussing things like sustainability for the group itself and um, naming, everyone wants an elder to name something now. So all these kind of business-like things were also um, discussed at camp. And of course, my final and favorite one. Yeah, that's Elvis. So Elvis came to culture camp and um, you'll see the gentleman singing there is actually Daryl Brass Jr. who is our elder for the ARPA virtual conference. So you'll see Daryl in his official capacity when he's not Elvis. Um, but one of the things that the elders also pointed out was um, the need to celebrate culture and celebrate themselves. So we had a cultural celebration and we called it the AKA Elder Talent Show, but it was a time for people to get together and laugh and share and connect and deal with social isolation. And those who are in recreation who are on this call, can. it was just one of these things that really confirmed the power that recreation has to bring to people together also is the power that people we have as a um, sector to help heal. And I, the one thing that I will share as a final note, and then i turn it back to Brianna, is that one elder, so she stepped up, she sang, um, she's a very quiet lady, very quiet, never said a word, but she stepped up that night and she sang a traditional song. And then the next day she came back to us and she said, you know, when I went to residential school, it stole my voice as a child. Coming back that night at the celebration and singing again, I got my voice back at culture camp. And it was just about how we as allies, our job is to create these safe and ethical spaces so that elders can do their job and learn and heal. And we step back and that's our, that was our role that ARPA had in terms of this event. So that's it. I just have one last slide. So of course I have to thank sponsors. So Calgary Foundation, we love you. Canadian Institute of Health Research, Gibson Energy, and the New Horizons programs from um, the federal government all came together to help support this project, as did our partners, because we all acknowledge the importance of this work. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back to you, Brianna, to properly introduce our, our headliners, our Beatles, Rolling Stones maybe, a little more energetic, um, and then we'll continue on. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, it's really crazy to think that August is now so far away. And I just want to add a quick note that I really enjoyed the time that I had at Culture Camp getting to meet 
uh, Dr. Regin Rose Crowshoe and many other elders and just getting to see everyone, but especially the elders have that chance to connect and share stories and laugh and heal together. So it was really a privilege of getting to see all those different ceremonies from all the different Treaty 7 elders. And it's something I'm gonna hold close and will continue to hold close for the rest of my life. So I'd say we set the bar pretty high and I think Dr. Reg and Rose can attest to that. <laughs> um, but now I will officially introduce our lovely headliners. So uh, Dr. Reg and Rose Kroshu are honored, are honored Blackfoot elders and traditional knowledge keepers. Together, they have been advisors for many committees with national, provincial and local scopes, focusing on work with elders, youth, culture, and the environment. Um, they are also both instrumental in the development of the Elders Knowledge Circle, and they work closely with the United Way of Calgary and area. Uh, Dr. Kroshu is a former chief of the Pikani Nation and also a regular lecturer at academic institutions like the University of Calgary, and was also very influential in the development of the education program at Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump. So welcome Dr. Reginald Kroshu. A quick note to participants, um, there will be time at the end of this webinar to ask any questions. So I welcome you to type your questions into the chat box and myself and our tech team here will monitor those and come back to them at the end. So um, I'll read those questions off at the end to Regin Rose, but for now I hand it over to Dr. Regin Rose. Please take it away. Okay. Good morning. Maybe I'll let uh, uh, Rose introduce herself. <clears throat> okay, Itamik's Kanatani. Itanik go a coin the marquee. The dump to to me is Kinipigani. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Rose Crochu, and I'm, and I'm from the Pigani Nation. Number 147A. We live about two hours south of uh, Calgary. We just, we're just across the river from the historic site of the Buffalo Jump. We live straight across from there. And uh, it's just an honor to be on this webinar. I'd like to thank uh, Brianna and Janet for the wonderful introduction and the presentation that Janet presented. It's so, it's so uh, overwhelming. Of, uh, of the information and uh, being there at the uh, at the camp was such a awesome feeling because we've never met in person with our knowledge keepers for about a year and a half. And it was so good to meet each other, the stories and just, it was just so overwhelming. And I, and I, uh, I'd like to thank the ARP for this, for this, uh, for helping out with the, I think it's about our third year we go in. But to begin with, we had to make relatives, like as Janet stated, we had to make relatives first, get to know who ARP is all about, get to know who the knowledge keepers are all about. And from that, we build great uh, relationships and uh, we're able to collaborate of things of that we wanted to do, especially having teachings from the land where the parks and uh, recreation gave us that venue to, to participate. And the learnings that were, they were overwhelming the learnings, especially at the camp, because we had, as Janet said, there was different uh, 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 people from different uh, cultural areas. And each day was a learning experience because each day was, was probably Black, it was Blackfoot. Next day was Cree. Next day was Midawin Way and then the Stony Way. So we got to learn, even though as knowledge keepers, we still learn from each other. But the thing that was amazing all with all the, uh, the uh, cultural groups, the main thing was the smudge. It was everybody used the smudge, whatever they used it in uh, with different herbs and all that. But the, the, the main point was to open that communication with a smudge. So that was really good. And also the, um, we, we, we uh, got to share the governance of how we're governed, you know, with the land and all that. Rich will probably talk more on that. But that was just, and the, L, and the youth were there to experience this. It, they, they were learning and it was just, 
overwhelm and of what I can't express anymore how it's there. So I think the importance of making relatives is really important because that's the only way we're gonna understand each other. And each year it gets better and more capacity building. Like as Janet said, we got the elders to have a, a, a helper and a helper that's, that's building relatives. And mainly it's how we learn is watching and hearing. You have to watch very carefully because as Reggie and I were young, that's what we, what we did. We watched and we heard the stories. We heard the teachings. It may not have made sense at that time, but now we look back, oh, this is our knowledge. And, and our neuro, knowledge and learning is every day we learn, not only when the, you will stop learning when you leave the face of the earth. So that's, and with those teachings, I just, I was just blessed to have those and to share them with, with the other nations and other of our uh, settlers. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for um, uh, your words, Rose. Um, I just want to say uh, um, it's a, uh, uh, I think as I look at uh, the concept of uh, the camp and uh, uh, the partnerships we had going into camp, <clears throat> that was so important to have those partnerships. Otherwise, camp wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have the resources as elders or indigenous communities or even the location to be able to bring all, um, to bring the elders together to start building any type of capacity. So I often talk about uh, um, the concept of um, system poverty. Uh, we practice in our oral system and historically the, uh, our relationship to the land gave us all the resources so that we can come together and build capacity and share knowledge historically. But after the uh, newcomers came and treaties were signed, resources were taken uh, and used in a different, uh, 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 with a different government. And we, once we were put on the reserves, we didn't have the land base to put, to bring together our elders and use the resources to build capacity. And that, uh, that's what I talk about when I look at system poverty. Our oral system was compromised at that time. Uh, the resources that come from, um, uh, natural resources that come from Canada today are, are governed by the legislative government. Uh, and they um, share the resources through uh, um, their concept of social justice. So when, when that sharing from a Western perspective happens, indigenous people only get, uh, you might say living uh, resources, housing, education, and uh, so on. But for building capacity, there's no resources. And that's why we talk about uh, the value of partnership like ARPA and uh, uh, the other organizations that were on that sheet that uh, Janet represented uh, or showed on the screen with all those other groups. It was good to have uh, those partnerships so the camp can actually happen. Um, uh, the, the, the elders got together uh, probably about maybe six or seven years ago. I think prior to that, uh, in the urban area of Calgary, the elders um, were isolated from each other. Uh, not only because they had uh, uh, distinct different languages and cultures in the urban area, 
that come from different parts in Canada, but also uh, they, uh, uh, when they lived in the urban area, uh, they were in certain parts of the city that uh, they worked with different organizations. And as you know, in the city, there was many organizations. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the elders we have in the city were scattered throughout all these organizations. They were asked to be elders advisory, elders technical support, elders sacred support, uh, elders uh, knowledge support. Um, so these elders were, some of them were sitting up to 10 on up to 10 committees. So they were so stretched they, and busy helping organizations in the city. They, the health organizations and the and education and industry and government, they were scattered throughout. They wanted to support each other because they felt isolated uh, helping these different organizations. So they came together, the elders in the city came together <laughs> and uh, uh, they wanted to support each other with traditional knowledge. They weren't sacred elders, but they were, each of them had knowledge from their cultural ways. Um, and uh, uh, they wanted to uh, support each other. So they came together to support each other. And when the different First Nations got together in an urban setting, they presented, um, a pipe or had a pipe ceremony with the Treaty 7 uh, uh, indigenous communities on the res from the reserves. And they uh, um, uh, agreed to help each other, support each other. And that's really where the elders uh, uh, advisory in the, com in the Calgary area started. Uh, so these uh, uh, elders got together and supported each other with uh, 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 their uh, uh, knowledge, indigenous knowledge, to to advise uh, organizations and groups. So when they got together, um, they were able to spread the workload and and work uh, to be able to be comfortable to help other to help organizations with the support of other elders that were supporting them either with knowledge or practice, traditional practice. Um, but after a few years, as, uh, as uh, um, uh, um, Janet alluded to, we lost some of our elders and, and some of them uh, 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 ended up in the hospital. So the capacity of, the workload stayed or build, built up, but the capacity of elders went down. And in an oral culture, uh, being there in person is so vital because of oral knowledge. <clears throat> so the elders talked about needing um, to come together and start building human capacity so that they can teach more elders, but also um, more, more knowledge, uh, technical knowledge elders. They didn't want to teach sacred knowledge because that was to the sacred elders, but they were talking about technical knowledge and, and, and uh, uh, traditional knowledge uh, to, to build on those uh, uh, capacities. So that's where the idea of the camp came up to invite the elders to come together to talk about uh, strategizing how we might build capacity. But at the same time, they wanted to use the camp to also build capacity. So we didn't send invitations out or, or a poster saying we're going to build elder capacity because if we did that, we there'd be many people coming to camp. And we have to we have to follow protocol of how we recognize and validate elders as we move ahead. So the elders um, 
use their traditional invitation, I guess, or tra their traditional processes in inviting uh, potential elders. And, and one of the uh, processes that they used was to invite the helpers that they were using from the many different cultures, uh, all their young people or elders that uh, uh, were helping already ceremonialists, sacred elders and technical elders. It was those elders that, that we then we used to step up the next level uh, to be elders. So uh, we invited uh, uh, the helpers and, and, uh, and they were limited to how many we can help or uh, invite because uh, uh, of COVID at the time. Uh, so we got, we were able to come together at this camp, and those were the two reasons of building capacity, not only in knowledge, but human capacity. Uh, we don't have enough resources uh, and locations in the urban area to come together regularly to build uh, knowledge capacity and human capacity, you, uh, because we, it is a land-based teaching also. So it's hard to get those uh, main parts to, to support the elders. And I'm very glad with ARPA and their uh, allyship in working with uh, that connection to the land. So the elders are uh, um, uh, wanted to build capacity because a lot of our elders that ended up at residential school left the re reserves and they ended up in urban areas. And uh, when they left and ended up in urban areas, they didn't speak their language. They didn't uh, 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 depend on their traditional knowledge. They wanted to turn to be non-indigenous people. They were ashamed of being indigenous. Those were all effects from the residential school. But at an older age, when you get up into your 60s and, and so on, uh, those elders, uh, even though they haven't spoke their language for many years, some of them about 50 years, uh, were coming back and saying, I remember these stories. I remember the language and here is how to say words. And this was all taken away from me at residential school. And I never felt that I would ever use this knowledge again, but here I'm coming back now and they're bringing all this knowledge together. So it was, it was uh, um, uh, I think it, to the elders, they felt that it was, uh, um, a gift for these elders that were away from their cultures, distant from their culture for so long. And at their older age, they were bringing back knowledge that some of the elders were looking for. So that was part of the capacity building, but these elders that never practiced their ways and became helpers uh, were the ones that are starting their journey into coming back to their uh, indigenous practices and become uh, elders at a later date. So that those were building capacities. And I see the elders are, are, are reaching some of their goals. Um, and, and as I talk about residential schools, I, uh, you know, I think about uh, uh, when I uh, was young, I went to school, before I went to school, I went to a different school. I, I went to a, a traditional model of schooling uh, through my uh, parents and my grandmother and uh, the elders in the community. And my first uh, 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 education that I went to was a traditional model. We had age grade society. So I was put into an age grade society. We, our age grade societies uh, built our levels in school. In today's uh, written system, 
we have education levels like kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. Uh, but our levels were different. Ours were age grade societies. So, and each society was related to the land-based teaching. So my first grade was the uh, Little Birds. Uh, I went to school with the Little Birds and then the Chickadees. And then uh, there was the, uh, um, uh, the Bumblebees and then the Kit Foxes and, and so on through the Brave Dogs and Chicken, Prairie Chicken Societies. So it was that age grade society level that was our education. And as I went to that school, I was taught who I was. And when I went to that education, I was taught the language, I was taught creation. Uh, I was taught uh, uh, how, uh, uh, who I was and how to take on my challenges. One of the things that was important that I still hold, uh, I still hold to, to, to myself, but other elders also understand is the fact that indigenous people have um, a social responsibility to their society, indigenous society laws, like any other society. So I look at that as an indigenous person, I'm transparent and responsible to indigenous natural laws because natural laws is all what was created. And as natural laws interact, uh, uh, we experience developing um, absolute laws that we follow today. Um, and the jurisdiction is creation itself. Uh, so we have laws and jurisdiction. The laws are natural laws and creation itself is, a, is our jurisdiction and is my responsibilities to those natural laws uh, to look after our environment, the earth, the, uh, the universe. So it was from that understanding that I, need, I, I took on my challenges. But one day I ended up at residential school and uh, uh, residential school was, uh, uh, I know the first day my grandmother brought me I experienced uh, having to go through a locked barbed wire fence where the kids were playing on the inside and I was an outsider coming in. Uh, when I was allowed to come in and run around with the kids in the, in the schoolyard, uh, uh, and it was the Indian agent that came and threatened my parents. If I don't go to residential school, they were going to jail. And that's why I ended up at the barbed wire fence that day. And as I ran in to meet my brothers and sisters and play with them in the schoolyard, all of a sudden I heard a bell ringing and all the kids ran towards the school and I was uh, shocked, I guess. And then I was wondering what was happening or is there an emergency? So I naturally ran back to the fence where my grandmother was and the gate was locked. So I found myself outside and everybody running into the school, but the, the head schoolmaster came and, and coaxed me back into the school. And that was my introduction to a transformation that I would look at. Uh, it was a hard transformation. Uh, since the Indian agent threatened my parents that if I don't go to residential school, they're going to jail. So a transformation I went through was a transformation by conforming. If you don't do this, these are the consequences uh, that came from policies and, and the written system and, and laws. So as I went through residential school, uh, that transformation by conforming, I learned uh, how to read and write uh, and numeration but I learned uh, because there was uh, that underlying understanding that if you don't uh, uh, follow these uh, uh, learnings, then you're going to be uh, uh, punished. So that was conforming. And 
The other thing we were punished for is if we speak our language, sing our songs, do our dances, uh, uh, any of our traditional knowledges and practices. If we, if we bring any of those in, then we were punished for that. I went to residential school at five years old, and um, I came out uh, nine years uh, after when I was uh, 14 years. So I did my nine years at residential school, but I had to I had to survive a place that I would look at as a, uh, I learned how to read and write enumeration, but the price I paid was uh, I heard one elder describe it as an evil price because you had to survive physical, sexual, and mental abuse for nine years to transform by conforming uh, to legislated uh, written policies. And it was that uh, uh, moving into a different world that was whole, that was, uh, 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 that hit us with trauma, and that distanced us from our knowledge, our traditional knowledge, from our traditional practices. And some of the kids were were married right out of residential school. The head schoolmaster would marry some of the girls out to to non-indigenous uh, uh, communities so that they won't come back and. Uh, and we were, uh, our indigenous uh, identity was taken away. And a lot of our people suffered through those uh, uh, traumas. They didn't even want to be indigenous when they came out. And that's why they ended up in the city or moving away from the uh, reserve. Uh, so that distance from taking away from our culture, uh, that took away from the capacity the elders needed to maintain our traditional ways. So I was 14 when I was came when I came out of residential school, uh, and I wanted. Uh, I, I'm glad my my grandmother was there. She she uh, uh, helped me to heal uh, in our traditional ways and brought it, Rose and I back to the smudge, and that's how we raise our kids today. But however, uh, on the other side, uh, I wanted to heal, but I couldn't for 14 years. Uh, from 14 years, I'm 70 years old now, and uh, it's all those years of wanting to heal. But first of all, the information of residential schools were swept under the rug. Nobody in Canada knew about residential schools. So when you talk about healing from re uh, residential schools, there wasn't an acknowledgement. When the prime minister acknowledged, it wasn't enough because Canadians didn't re realize what happened. And then uh, uh, the TRC Truth and Reconciliation happened. Uh, it wasn't, they made recommendations, but they weren't moved on because people didn't understand. The only thing that helped people realize what happened was they found the 215 children that didn't come home from residential school in unmarked graves. And that became real to Canadians. And as that became real, now I'm starting to look at being able to heal because acknowledgement is being there. Now I can heal. Uh, so it took uh, many years to say, I want to know my ways. I, I want to use my ways and I want to heal. So those are the, those were the importance of building capacity. Uh, I think I wanted to talk about with regards to allyship. Uh, uh, we have we understand two systems uh, 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 exist. Uh, the first system that we were we we knew existed uh, was like when I went to my first schooling, which was to the little birds. It was a traditional. Uh, indigenous knowledge and indigenous practice of education. So our, our, our practices to survive as a group of people, uh, any kind of organization to achieve our goals, 
the concept of building relatives was so important. So we start our, our uh, calls to order with sanctify kindness to provide a safe space. And then we go into a, a discussion uh, uh, in that safe space because of sanctified kindness, but that safe space allows us to build relatives so we can achieve our goals together. And it's not any different than Western organizations, written organizations today, when they look at the concept of uh, uh, India, whether it's organizational structures or corporate world or governance world, um, they have organizations that work with written systems, policies, uh, and, the, and the, um, the understanding that partnerships were legal and, and allyships were an understanding of supporting each other. Those are Western concepts of um, uh, part, uh, uh, partnerships and allyship. But our understanding parallel to that would be uh, making relatives within organizations. So when we uh, 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 talk to organizations about building relatives, they didn't understand because they were talking about a written system and saying building relatives is too personal. Uh, I only have a 40 hour work week and I got goals and objectives I need to achieve. So allyship and partnership was more important. But I think if we look at the oral systems of building partners, we were able or building relatives, we can get a lot more understanding happening within system. And that's where I uh, value the relationship relationship with ARP that's willing to come out and say, okay, we want to hear what is, what is the uh, information and what is really a, a relative building within an oral system. Uh, so they're looking at in, in systems and as they look at it in systems and practices from an oral world, then they're starting to look for parallel. And as we build parallels, those parallels become, in systems and practices, those parallels become best practices to move ahead in, in working together to achieve goals, to in, include indigenous principles and practices. So that was one big value with ARP in, in understanding of relatives. Uh, but uh, I, the more value uh, that the elders uh, were talking about at camp was the value of land base. Our language comes from the ecosystem and the environment. We're not, we're going to lose our language in the city or in, in, in written schools that, that don't use land-based teachings for, for language. Uh, we have oral laws in our stories that talk about how the laws allow us to, to learn our language and we have to be uh, uh, responsible and transparent to those language laws in our oral culture to speak our language. But if those uh, values and principles aren't represented in schools and written education, then we're not learning our language. And this is where the connection with uh, ARP is so important to go back to that land-based teaching with the elders and, and bring those stories about our language laws, for example, and, and how we hear sounds and, and, and vibrations and how they become words in our language so that we can uh, describe and, and understand each other uh, from our experiences that we had build, to build our language. So those are the, the three parts that I wanted to talk about was, First of all, the capacity building at camp is important. Um, the concept of uh, residential school and how healing has to take place. Uh, and it took a long time for recognition to happen. So any kind of healing can start. And then uh, the last part I wanted to talk about was the relationship building with ARPA, which is so important. Uh, uh, to get back to 
including indigenous values in today's world and understanding. So with that, uh, maybe I can, uh, I don't know if uh, I'm on time or, or over time or under time. Thanks, Reg. We have about 25 minutes left and then we'll have room for about a 10 minute question and answer period. So 25 minutes left on whichever else. Okay. I'm just going to let Rose say a, a few things here. Sure. I think the, the importance of elders is really vital for, uh, for, uh, for, for, both, uh, for both communities. And the reason why I say that is in the written part, you have uh, filing cabinets, you know, you, you got information, you file it away. But for us, our elders are our walk and filing cabinets because they're, they're there and they have the information. Whereas um, on the other side, you, you have to look and look for that policy, whatever it relates to and all that. Whereas the, uh, the knowledge keepers or the elders, they have it in their, in their mind. And I think I just want to uh, just uh, uh, add one piece. We, uh, one of the initiatives that we had with the ARPA was a tea, a tea ceremony. And a lot of people were questioning a tea ceremony, we're gonna drink tea? And, and their concept was totally different. And that's where Rich said, we need to parallel this. So we had it and it was, the, the, the room was huge. They used one ballroom at the, uh, wherever we had, I forget the place, was it? Uh, uh, that Lake Louise, the Lake, the name. Lake Yeah, Lake Louise, that ballroom was packed. And, and when we had that, we had, I think it was three rounds and we wanted to get information. So the information we divided into groups and then we, we, uh, we come back again. And some of the comments that came out of there was that, gee, we got business done really quick. And it was, we knew where we're going. So as oral, in our oral culture, when, when we have a, a decision to make, we all talk about it, we all share. And, and what are the next steps? How are we going to get there? How are we? So that that concept has been with us for years. Our ancestors, that's how they uh, operated. So we decided I, I just share that. And then uh, I don't know. I just thought it was uh, it was kind of fitting at this time, especially the viewers that are watching. Thank you. Um, maybe I could just add uh to the concept of um, what Rose was talking about with regards to policies. Um, one of the things that I heard from the elders was saying that um, we come from two different worldviews and, but the goals in those worldviews are the same. Uh, uh, to live a good life, healthy life, to survive. Those are goals, but the, uh, the, those goals are accommodated by two different worldviews. Uh, so in our worldview, we have a responsibility and transparency to natural laws and, and the jurisdiction of creation. And it's out of that understanding that our oral system evolved. And it's through our oral systems of practice and language that allows us to develop traditional knowledge. Uh, I've heard the elders say that in the newcomers in the Western knowledge, um, uh, they heard in the church and in the Bible and the residential school and in Indian agent offices, they heard the, the uh, a phrase, uh, uh, God gave dominion to man. So when, when the elders go back to that phrase, God give dominion to man, they recognize it as uh, God giving superiority to man above all natural laws so that man uh, can make the laws. So as man put together writing and reading and enumeration, uh, they uh, use those pra those systems and practices uh, to make legislation, to make laws, and to give um, 
uh, a way to be responsible and transparent to those uh, written legislations that we follow today uh, through policies and so on. So those are that would be the written system that the elders are talking about, which is different from the oral system. So when we look at two systems, they clash. Uh, I would say when the, the oral system and the written system met, that was, I understand, at the time of treaty. When they signed treaty, the, the oral, the elders from the oral system worldview said, we'll all, we'll all benefit uh, and survive from the environment and the resources from the ecosystem, because that's what we need to all survive. And that was their understanding at the treaty. But the newcomers came in and they agreed that they would share the resources. So after treaties were signed as an agreement, the elders and the newcomers agreed on it. And today the elders still support that. But one big mistake happened after the treaty was the newcomers with their written system and Western legislation decided to administer the treaties. And once they decided to administer the treaties, then the, from the treaties, they put together the Indian Act, education policies, childcare policies, reservation policies, uh, policies that the Indian agent controlled the in, indigenous communities on. So jurisdiction was given through the Indian Act. Uh, so that imposed, that written system imposed on our oral system. And it's all those years of misunderstanding that brought us to, to uh, uh, TRC, Truth and Reconciliation, or the time we're looking at reconciliation today. So when we look at those, both practices, and as Rose was saying, in Western practices, when we have a meeting, we're used to a boardroom, we're used to a gavel, we're used to agendas, we're used to using English language, we're used to using uh, written policies that were approved by boards uh, to give us directions on how we make decisions. That's how important policies are. But when we look at our oral culture, our practices of making decision was the smudge was a call to order, the venue was a circle, our languages, land-based languages were so important. And, and, and our, we didn't, our oral policies would be the elders that, that know the stories and practices. So if we need help or direction in any of our decision-making uh, oral practices, it would be the elders that are part of that, invited to that circle or come to that circle uh, that would give us direction on how we would uh, uh, move ahead. So that direction is parallel to the concept of Western written policies. And that's why elders are so important. So when we talk about building capacity, we're losing our elders, we're losing our direction. We need to bring that knowledge back and build capacity. And that's why the camp was so important uh, uh, that we had in August. Perfect. Thank you, guys. No, that was really, really insightful stuff. Um, I Is that kind of all that you're good with sharing? Is there anything more you want to add before I head into questions for you both? Well, I'm just thinking maybe we'll give a little more time to questions because yeah. sometimes yeah. questions Thank bring you. out more discussion. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Perfect. So I do see that we have one question coming from Maureen McKenzie. So I will read it out to you. She says, thank you for sharing Reg and Rose. Your wisdom and willingness to share is so valuable. Um, we know from our census that there are over 800 residents who identify as Indigenous in her community, but they are hidden, so to speak. So she is wondering, how can we reach out to support or create a safe space for them to grow within and share their culture? And let me know if you want me to um, read that. 
I, I think today, when we look at reconciliation, the Truth and uh, uh, Reconciliation Commission that happened, they came out with uh, 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 recommendations. And, uh, and, and at the time, they don't call them recommendation. They call them calls to action because action needs to happen. Uh, sometimes recommendations sit on shelves. But when you talk about action, those TRC calls to actions are so important. We need to start fulfilling some of those because those are tangible practices to uh, 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 help uh, uh, those 800 uh, that uh, uh, have been identified or some of them that have been identified. So uh, I think uh, um, though that's a start with the TRC calls to action. Uh, organizations, like all Canadians, Indigenous or non-Indigenous, we have a responsibility to understand what reconciliation means. Uh, I know we're grappling with reconciliation, same with uh, non-Indigenous people. Um, but when we talk about uh, uh, reconciliation, we need to start working with organizations to connect with te technical elders so that they can start building strategies or framework to help understand what transformation means and to help transform that indigenous knowledge to be a part of decisions that are made to achieve goals for organization. So those strategy building, indigenous strategy building is important for organizations because it includes building relatives, includes uh, protecting smudging, it includes that uh, safe space. So framework for strategy, I would say is important. And just a, a comment on uh, um, um, buildings or uh, using smudge. I, I think smudge within organizations or communities or oral people, we have to understand smudge is a practice of call to order, just like a gavel is. And that call to order provides that safe space to bring our values and build that ethical space where two, uh, not only opposing, but two opinions can come together and make that ethical space come alive. So right now, Indigenous people were sort of locked out of that ethical space because of Western procedure policies, Robert's Rules of Order and Gavel. I think we need to open the door to parallels and start protecting the smudge and circles so that we can allow a, a safe passage of uh, Indigenous principles and values to be a part of discussions. And those are some of the directions that the elders were talking to uh, uh, the ARPA uh, to put include in their goals and objectives. And um, thanks for that, Reg. And so I have a question that builds on that. And to to Maureen's question, because we do get that a lot, is how where do I start? And I often like to say it's like dating. If we go back to that relationship or build relatives as a metaphor. You know, when, if you're dating someone and your first date, you meet at the coffee shop and they actually have the minister ready and your white dress is there and they're marching you down the aisle to get married. You're like, get me out of here, crazy people. I don't want to be in a relationship with you if you're already taking me to the altar. Right. So I think it's really about a slow process as to finding where people are at, what their interests are and to drop your own agenda. Because if you come already with a purpose and something in mind why wouldn't people just run away so i think that that trust trust so i guess the point i'm getting to is what can you do to actually you have the point is to create a trust to create trust so that you actually even want to hang out with each other because if they don't want to hang out with you as a person why would they want to hang out with you as an organization so um sorry that's just a comment but i think one thing i would like and you could talk to that if you want um reg and rose but one thing my question was You've said it a few times and I get it, but I just want you to clarify when you say a technical elder versus a sacred elder. And so what do you actually mean when you say that? Um, so I, I come from a, uh, 
an oral uh, system practice, but I also understand indigenous knowledge. So when I uh, uh, when I'm exposed to the Western practice of policies, organizational structures, uh, uh, legislation, uh, and your responsibilities and transparencies, I always run into uh, to uh, um, things like board members, people that are, are elected to a board follow uh, a structure and protocols that they make decisions for the organizations. They'll approve whatever is brought to the board. That's their protocol. It's kind of a sacred protocol because they, they approve these uh, uh, direct or these uh, pro, uh, directions that they get from the from their organization, but within their organization, they have professionals, expertise that are the technicians that build on build these uh, 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 structure or build these uh, proposals and information that goes to the board for approval. It's those technicians that are important because they're the ones that are structuring these, uh, uh, this information to go to the board and the board has their protocol to approve it. So there's two different protocols, uh, the board protocol. And so as an oral culture, if I was looking at bringing together a uh, uh, written default system uh, elder and I just grab an elder, without knowing whether they're a board of director or a, an expert or, or a technician, and I bring them in and ask them for uh, information, I'm gonna get two types of information. One is a protocol to a board and the other one is a, a technical information for building information. So that's critical to understand in our oral culture, my parallel to the board uh, uh, protocol would be our sacred elders that run our ceremony. They have sacred protocols because they approve a lot of times what is brought to them. So those sacred approvals are important. And then we have technical elders, elders that know the language, elders that know the stories, elders that are familiar with the structures and and practices and oral systems, those elders can talk in as an expert or a technician to those practices, but yet they're not um, uh, ceremonialists or, or, or sacred elders. So if we didn't understand elders and we just grab an elder, you could end up with an elder that has sacred protocols that they're responsible to, that would can change the direction of information that you're trying to find, or sometimes you hit the right elder and it's a technical elder. So we need to ask these elders uh, their validation, are they sacred elders or technical elders? And, and our validation is represented, our, our physical documentations of uh, validation is represented through songs. Uh, so you would ask for, in our case, what songs do you represent? Uh, uh, it's it would be just as any uh, any uh, uh, written culture that I would ask, what certificates do you do have? What are your validations that are written documents? <laughs> you have a right to ask for that that information. So I hope that helped to the understanding of different elders. No, thank you very much. It really did. Um, we've got a few more questions too. I'm just circling back quick to Ken Luck as he was wondering uh, what you recommend around first steps in starting this relationship. And I think a lot of that was touched on uh, your first answer to our first question. And I just wanted to add into what Janet had said previously in today's webinar, but also on our September 30th webinar, where it's Again, listening and hearing with an open mind without an agenda and just being open to those um, relationships and seeing where they go and recognizing that they 
it's a slow process and that is fine. Um, I'm just scrolling through. I think we had another one. We have Tom McGee. He's a counselor for the town of Drayton Valley and is an ARPA member. And he mentions that he's been gifted a first name or first nation name from Dr. Reg Crochu some time ago at the Calgary Stampede. So in Ini Sukumobi, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it translates to Buffalo Boy. And his question is, um, my question is first steps of acknowledging and healing for small rural and urban municipalities. So, so good to hear and see, see you both. Sorry, that's more of a, I think a statement than a question. <laughs> um, but I think too, tying into the reconciliation, ARPA has created a Indigenous Awareness and Engagement Toolkit. And I think that can definitely be another step within an organization to move forward in terms of reconciliation. So I guess I have another question for you, Dr. Regin Rose, is from a recreation perspective, I know ARPA is leading the way a little bit. Um, what do you recommend in terms of what reconciliation could look like from a recreation perspective? Um, first of all, I just want to I just want to acknowledge you, Inis Kumapua. It's been a while since I, I've, I've uh, uh, met him, and it's glad, it's good to hear from you today. Um, and if we look at that, uh, uh, from I think you said from Parks and Recreation's perspective, what could rec uh, reconciliation look like? Uh, I, I think that's very important that, first of all, I think we need to understand that uh, um, uh, we do have a responsibility as all Canadians to look at reconciliation uh, because it's over 200 years of uh, confusion and clashing with Indigenous systems uh, that to reconciliation. So I think we need to uh, uh, understand that we have a responsibility. And in order to fulfill that responsibility, we need to have the willingness to be open uh, to a, a meeting. And, and, uh, and as we are open to meeting, we need to bring with us concepts of uh, uh, trust and respect, to build that trust and respect as a first goal and objective. How do we build trust and respect? Uh, is it inclusion of the smudge or is it development of ethical space? Uh, uh, those practices help us to build respect. And uh, I think trust and respect is your first goal uh, is important and uh, uh, understanding that uh, we all have a responsibility to reconciliation. And, and Indigenous people are asking also. Uh, we've been, uh, uh, so many years we've been uh, exposed to written systems and still clashing. How do we build trust and respect? Because the trust and respect was lost right at the time legislation to administer the treaty was introduced. That's where we lost trust and respect. We've got to put it back. And Thank you. I have a couple more. I have one from Jarrett Hobers. Uh, he says, thank you for the explanation of the smudge as it relates to the gavel. Um, he would like to better understand the greeting slash recognition and appropriate use of the term relations. Um, I would say thanks for the, to Jared for, uh, for the question. Uh, and, uh, um, I agree with him. It's so important to understand, uh, because we need to look at the concept of cultural interpretation and cultural, uh, translation 
of phrases and words that we use. So when I look at the concept of allyship and the concept of a, a partnership within the context of Western organization, those are legal, um, uh, legal uh, agreements and partnerships we get into. Uh, that's part of the uh, oral system uh, uh, um, um, organizational structural world. That's that's part of that world that we live in, and we use those uh, allyships and partnerships in our forty-hour or for uh, uh, our time within our workday, uh, and that's very important. So when we introduce the concept of relationship, it has a very different tone in that uh, Western written organization structures. It's not understood. We need to culturally interpret and trans culturally translate. So as I think about those, I, I, I look at um, in our world, we understand the concept of the smudge uh, but we also understand kindness and call to order is a part of the smudge. And that kindness and call to order is our oral practice to introduce people to a transformation through building relatives. So they can have a buy-in into building relatives with this organization or society that we have and, and, and that would be their buy-in. But building relatives is going to be building relatives within the context of that society's time, which would parallel to a 40-hour work week uh, of that society. The rest of the time of building relatives or enjoying relatives is at home. But building relatives through transforming uh, people through uh, kindness and call to order of the smudge uh, in a safe space, that's a practice that we call building relatives because within those uh, age grade societies, for example, uh, the uh, other classmates become our relatives and we need to learn together and achieve those learning goals together and we need each other. Uh, so we are relatives in school, but when we're at home, we have our own relatives. So we need to understand those cultural interpretations and translations between two systems. They, the two systems have their own language. And I think it's critical to understand in a cultural interpretation translation context. And I hope that helps. Dr. Ridge. I have one more question I think we have time for. We have about seven minutes left and it's from Kelsey Lalonde and she has the question of how can young people help with reconciliation? Uh, I'll let Rose speak to some of this, but all I'll say is uh, as a young person, we need to understand that we can approach indigenous knowledge and indigenous practices. That's open to young people. Uh, and that we need to understand that. And when I was young, approaching indigenous knowledge was approaching an elder. Uh, and uh, uh, when I approach elders when I was young, uh, bringing them um, sage, uh, bringing them berries, bringing them uh, uh, sweet grass uh, uh, would be how I approached elders at a young age because I didn't have, I didn't buy tobacco and didn't have money. I didn't have any of that. As a young person, bringing those gifts like uh, sage that they use and berries and, and whatever we have access to, bringing them to an elder opens the door to an elder in building relationship that they want to share. They're going to be grateful for those gifts from young people and take in the young people as their 
as their children so that they can teach them. Uh, that's how I would look at building relatives with elders. It's that taking time to, to uh, um, understand uh, 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 how we might re make relationships. I, I, I always, uh, there's a lot of non-Indigenous uh, children that approach me with gifts. Maybe they made a bead, they, they'd sew some beadwork or, or they brought me sage or they brought me a, a branch with berries in it and, and, and uh, with that smile and, and asked me uh, 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 questions. And it was so good to accept them as relatives. And I, I, I start helping them with no problem. So I, I think that building that trust and respect is so important. Uh, I'll turn it to Rose, and she can give you a woman's perspective. I think for for as a female, on the female perspective, is helping out. Like I mean, I'm just going back when I was young, growing up. I helped my aunties and my uh, older relatives, my grandparents. I was there, and I just come and I'd start. Do you need anything? I, I won't say. Do you need anything? I'll be just there and have coffee, and then we start talking and. After they, you you start a conversation and all that, and then you go home, and then you come back, and then you help. I mean, this is just was this what I did? I helped out with, like, just helping out with the housekeeping in their house, checking if, uh, especially at berry time, I'd go pick them up, and we'd go picking berries, and we'll tell stories, and like Rich said, the roots. I remember my uh, when my when I was young, my grandma used to come and get all her grandchildren. And some of them said, no, I don't want to go. I just want to. So I went with her and I got that knowledge and that information. And today they asked me, well, how do you know so much, Rose? I said, because I went with grandma and she, this is what she taught. So it's always like, and another example is that that Calgary Stampede, we, we've been camping there for a number of years and people would phone me and say, could we help you to put your teepee? I said, yes, come over. And so they're all coming. They'll help us put the teepee. And some of them have, they made it every year they come and help. So that's building the relatives. And, and it's in a different perspective, whether it's uh, in, in a family or the gathering or whatever, but there's always, you make them feel welcome. And I think this is what we do as indigenous, we make people feel welcome. We don't make them feel like a stranger. We ask, what do you want? What do you want from me? What do you want? You know, it's always, but you put that aside and you open that communication. And I think that's that's the teaching that I give my uh, children, my grandchildren, and also I have two great grandsons. So they're learning and especially my great grandson, the first, the older one, he's learning a lot. Like he'll, uh, especially going to school and he's so excited when he comes home, he shares the information. And I was telling Ridge, she really different than when we went to school, we were conformed to what we had to learn a foreign way, even to the point where we even had a French accent, how they'd say words and we'd come home and my grandma would say, what you learn? And we'd say, well, this is what we learn. You know, how, does, how do you say orange? Orange, you know, like that. And we'd curl her and she'd say, is that what you learned? And then she'd tell us the Blackfoot way. So we had laughs and we had funny stories about just that uh, interpretation. But I know that my great grandson is enjoying the school because it's making him feel welcome and making him feel important. As a little guy, he's, he's six years old in grade one and he's learning who he is and he's able to share with whatever information he has. So that's a start there where the schools are starting to uh, uh, bring in the indigenous knowledge and working with the elders. So I just thought I'd add that. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. All right, I think we have, we're, we might run a little bit over time, but we have one final question left. Um, it's from Anne-Marie Bertagnoli. Um, she says that she's, if she's invited to a meeting with a mix of Indigenous people, she realizes that she needs to bring a gift. So she's wondering if the gift needs to go to the chief or to the elder. Um, does she bring a gift for both? Um, yeah, she's just wanting to know the correct way to show respect and to acknowledge who within a meeting such as that. 
Um, I think that's uh, that's an important mm -hmm. question. Um, as I was speaking before, I said uh, that the oral worldview, indigenous worldview with their oral systems was one side of the, of the treaty. The other side of the treaty was the, um, uh, uh, the newcomers with their Western worldview and their written system uh, that accommodates their Western uh, worldview. So those are the two signatures to the treaty. I think we need to we need to build more trust and respect between those two uh, uh, that signed the treaty at the beginning. Uh, because what happened when they signed, after they signed the treaty, the, new, the newcomers with their legislation implemented the treaty or they uh, administered the treaty. And through that administration process, they developed the Indian Act. And within the context of the Indian Act, um, there was, uh, I, I, they identified a chief and a council, along with identifying who is an Indian, what is an Indian reserve, and so on, uh, to develop their policies. But that was written document through the Indian Act that gave jurisdiction to chief and council. So therefore, chief and council becomes a third party government that is responsible to the Indian Act and the, the legis written legislators, and they don't really have that responsibility to the uh, oral practice or oral speakers. So when you come with a gift, are we gifting uh, the administration and the act that, that uh, uh, gives jurisdiction to chief and council, or are we gifting the traditional knowledge and oral practices that were the original part of the two that met at the beginning? So that's how I would look at recognizing the gifts that we bring to chief and council. We can't mix a chief and a traditional leader together because they have two completely different uh, transparencies and responsibilities uh, to two different systems. I hope that helped. Yeah. yeah, and I'll pass this back to Brianna, but I'd also say, Reg, that like, I just think of it as elders trump everybody. Like in, in whether it's a technical elder or a sacred elder, like in, you know, I guess it's a flat hierarchy. Obviously we want to show respect to everyone, but I just say the best, the best way to look at it will bring gifts for everyone. I was just setting, bring gifts. Everyone loves gifts. Woohoo, gifts for everyone. But I would say ultimately um, elders, because council will defer to elders too. So I think even in that, that action shows that elders trump, um, not that we're trumping, but in terms of that respect piece, we also respect to our elders. So um, thanks for those questions. And I'll turn it back to you, Bri uh, Brianna, to close us up. And thank you, Reg and Rose. You guys are amazing. I just, I just want you to know we hear, we're seeing all these chats coming through, thanking you for sharing and how amazing you are and how important uh, these these kind of actions are in terms of reconciliation, action, in terms of moving the discussion and the needle forward. So back to you, Brianna, and thank you guys. I love you guys. Good job. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Dana. And thank you again, Dr. Reg and Rose. This was such an amazing and insightful conversation as noted through the comments we're receiving, like Janet said. So I just want to acknowledge that you both have had such a huge role in how ARPA itself has shaped our journey on reconciliation. And we feel really grateful that we get to continue this work with you. And thank you again for your time today. And I'd like to thank all of our participants for joining us today with such high levels of engagement and conversation and great questions and just to the ARPA team for helping out in the background, making sure our tech is all running smoothly. So no one crashed out today. We're good to go. <laughs> but uh, thanks again, Dr. Reg and Rose. Um, that is the end of our webinar today. Everyone take care and 
And one final um, note, sorry, oh. Brianna, is that we will, in fact, this recording will be in on the ARPA website. We'll send it out to you. But we have an uh, oral knowledge hub to respect our elders and showcase their knowledge. So on the ARPA website are other recordings with Reg and Rose on what smudging is. Listen to the elders. They'll talk about reconciliation. So make sure that you hit the ARPA website and the Oral Indigenous Knowledge Hub, and it can answer some of your questions as well, because it is our own responsibility as we work towards reconciliation to educate ourselves mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. I just want to include, uh, uh, we've been honored uh, to, uh, to talk on this webinar and to all of you today. Uh, I think it's important that uh, uh, we share information and knowledge as we move ahead. We need to survive together. In, in Canada, we need to, we had 30 years of cultural awareness, but we never, we never solved anything. I, I think it's important we start looking at solutions. And, and what we talked about was uh, building on that goals and objectives of uh, building trust and respect. Those are solutions we're looking at as we move ahead. So I, I'm grateful to have this discussion. I'm sure if you need to uh, get a hold of uh, Rose and myself, um, you probably want to go through uh, ARPA. They have our contact information and uh, uh, they can share it with you. Thank you. Thank you both.